So um, just to get started, Brent, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Uh, let's just start off by um, learning a little more about your background. Tell us about your time at U.S. Digital Services and, um, and tell us about you. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks again, everybody, for, for having me. Um, I um, am currently with this uh, software startup called Rebellion Defense. And uh, for, for those services companies out there, don't worry, we're, we're a products company and we're not a service company, so we won't be competing with you or in your space at all. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a six-month-old company. We got about 39 people so far, um, and I am I am here to basically continue to hack procurement, so the government can buy uh, our our stuff as well as you know similar similar companies. Um, I've also got a small business. It's an LLC called Agile Buying, which um, I stood up about a year ago, and mostly that's been helping out people at the state level. Um, so that's been activities like running um, agile training to a class of, uh, you know, 20 plus people, um, as well as doing some acquisition strategy as they try to mature and move into digital services. Um, so that's, that's my side hustle. <laughs> um, but um, before that, so prior to three months ago, I was a federal employee for 12 years, all the time doing um, procurement. So I started off at U.S. Postal Service doing management consulting contracts. So that was four years and then a year at U.S. Army um, at Fort Belvoir doing construction contracts um, when BRAC was going on and they were closing different bases and that sort of thing. Um, and then I moved over to the Environmental Protection Agency to do IT contracts. And um, I was just kind of going about doing IT contracts just about the same way that I went that I did management consulting contracts and construction contracts because that's what everybody told me to do. And um, I was told I was uh, not bad at it and eventually led a team um, of contracting officers doing it. Um, and then one day my boss, my head of contracts or the deputy came to me and said, hey, there's this new training coming out and there's a few people we want to send forward and we want you to be one of them. I, so I was voluntold to be a part of that, but it, it was a turning point for me. So that training program was put on by US Digital Service, the procurement team, and in coordination with like a procurement policy group within uh, the White House as well, Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Um, and it was a six month long program and was all about teaching IT buyers about what modern technology practices are and looking to the commercial world about how how the commercial space buys tech like modern tech and kind of how to bring in those practices into government and leverage the flexibilities within the procurement regulations so find those flexibilities exploit them um, so that was a very that was a very challenging uh, course for a lot of us um, and, and a lot of us are still friends and kind of still work together and um, that's been great. I even still work with one right now here at Rebellion um, and it there was just a lot of paradigm shifts that that happened there, right? Um, so for example, um, you know, I used to think, well, I, I need to wire in all the technical requirements into the contract. Whether that, yeah, whether that be the, the vendor puts it in their proposal or I need to put it into my requirements document. Um, how, how else am I gonna get anything? But that's not the way it's done with some of the best tech companies in the world. That's not the way they approach tech. Um, so there were some really big changes and it took a lot of us, including myself, a while to figure all of that out. So it was helpful to, to be a part of a cohort and kind of go through that together. Um, but I soon realized that everything that I was doing at the EPA, and, and I'm talking like I was doing some of the biggest IT contracts for, for the agency, um, I was doing them wrong. And it was leading to poor outcomes. It was leading to buying and building technology in the same way that it had been built 40 years ago, you know, traditional waterfall 
software development life cycles, um, not building technology around humans, those, those sorts of things. Um, so in, in one sense, I felt like the, the scales fell from my eyes and um, I, I was opened up to this world where we can bring in modern technology into the federal government. And I feel like I had some tools and strategies that I could use now um, to make procurement less of a blocker to bringing in modern tech. Um, so, I went on there and then became on came on staff for three years at US Digital Service. I ended up leading the the training program that I was once a part of. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm no I'm not only the uh, the uh, the president of the hair hair club for men. I'm also the president. <laughs> I'm also a user. Yeah, so it's it was kind of like that. Um, is that so, the um, the DITAP training? That is the DITAP training program, the digital IT acquisition professional training program. It's for feds. Uh, so yeah, I ended up doing that. And then, you know, US Digital Service, they help um, and, and are embedded in multiple agencies, mo mostly four. And so sometimes they would need procurement strategy uh, help and I would help with that and sometimes hold their hand all the way through until, until contract award. And so that was, uh, that was great. Um, and, and a lot of fun. I learned from, I, I felt I very much had imposter syndrome at first, um, but, you know, followed around those people that were further ahead than me, like Tracy Walker and Jonathan Mostowski and, uh, and just was a sponge and learned a ton until I could kind of walk and run on my own and be able to be of, of, of more value. And eventually got to the point where, you know, I could start running my own procurement experiments to try to solve big problems. Well, so uh, speaking of experiments, uh, your talk in November was about one of those, uh, I presume, the Smithsonian uh, Museum. Do you, want, do you want to talk about that example and uh, maybe just give us a quick overview of, of what you did and maybe some of the, the main takeaways? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So it's, it's funny how I arrived at that particular experiment. And so the way it started was um, I, I thought, well, I saw in the DITAP training class where we would invite in vendors and have an open conversation with them about their pain points with the federal procurement process. And that really helped us students to have an increased level of empathy towards these small innovative vendors that want to do incredible things and wanted to bring incredible tech into the government. But the frustration and the ways that sometimes us procurement people created these convoluted procurements that became a blocker, in the end a blocker to digital delivery uh, to the end user. And so I thought, well, how can we have more of that regular conversation? Does it mean that I need to, need to start a meetup? And, uh, and, and first of all, like, is that even allowed for me to do under the USDS brand? Or do I need to do that on the side? Or like, that's not the real point. It's like, how can we help the movement along, right? And so it started there and then um, it, it was weird. Like it was one of those things like e eventually like I like waking up in the middle of the night thinking about something. And there was this idea of kind of, okay, maybe it should be more narrowly focused and, and, and talk about a, like maybe the experiment should be on a particular buy. And so we can take a, a problem and run a hypothesis against it and experiment that way. And so maybe it should be on the, the, the time of the procurement that leads up to the release of an RFP. And, and, and so, so, so in USDS fashion and really like the way that USDS goes about a lot of problems, and this comes from, you know, best practices with tech companies is, is kind of spending time to slow down and think deeply about the problem to be solved. Um, and, having an open conversation and putting that up on whiteboards and talking to a lot of people about that to validate that that is indeed a problem to be solved. And from there, moving into like a hypothesis about something to try out to try and solve that problem and even a test plan. Um, and then to iterate from there. So I actually started like putting together a, a problem statement and then specifically a hypothesis that, that kind of points back to, to that procurement problem and then kind of a test plan. And so once I had that, um, I would even like 
like start, you know, as they do in tech storyboard, what that thing could look like. And so I had something to talk to people about for, for them to help understand the problem I'm trying to solve and whether this hypothesis is even worth trying out. And so I just talked about that wherever I could. I was on a panel for an ACT-IAC um, conference, I don't know, a year ago yeah, about problem statements. And I inserted this, this thing that I wanted to try out. And then lo and behold, Smithsonian's, one of their museums walked up to me afterwards and she said, yeah, we might have something coming up that might be really appropriate here. And this is a, just a common story of like how USDS works. It's like you, we, you get crazy ideas and you're willing to take a, a, a risk, but you think about the problem deeply and come up with, with a plan and certain success criteria and find and partner with the coalition of the willing and go and just see what happens, fail fast. Um, and, uh, you know, don't try to do the whole thing and then look back, make it a little ways and then go back to your end user and figure out if, if this, if we still think that this is going to solve the problem. And so in this case in procurement, many times the end user, they're vendors. And so like, even when I was doing my, my, research for for this kind of problem and hypothesis and such and this this test i would go out to non-traditional vendors and just as ask them questions so although i've never been a, a ux researcher before um, i did my best in coming up with the script and would schedule 30 minutes with with each of them and just kind of walk through some open-ended questions mostly around like the 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 uh, why do, why do they feel collaboration is bad uh, between them and the federal government? Or what does, what does the federal government do um, that makes you say, no, I don't want to pursue that? Those sorts of questions. Um, when does it seem like communication shuts down? So I, I gathered more and more information to kind of validate that, yes, that is a problem. And that helped inform the test plan, right? And so eventually that test plan was applied towards a certain use case, which was the Smithsonian. And so the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, they wanted to build a digital thing um, around one of their exhibits. And so, um, yeah, I started working with them. Um, uh, they, it took them a while to secure funding. So we had a, a, a good amount of time to walk through things and I had a good amount of time to kind of document as, as we went along. Um, we were, I, I held their hand a lot and, uh, unfortunately I had to leave before it was totally done. Um, but we, we made a lot of progress. We built out the requirements document, the statements of objectives on the internet from the beginning. Um, we did the same with the request for proposal. Um, and, uh, we had our industry day was different as well. And so we actually had kind of a, well, what I told them is, uh, government like Smithsonian, I don't want you to write anything up front. I want us to have like a face-to-face -face conversation with some innovative vendors about the problem to be solved um, and how you think that the RFP should be structured. And so the idea is like with normal procurement, somebody, maybe just a few people in the government have their eyes and their brains focused on like the, the requirement, the work to be done and, and drafting that up, which eventually goes in the RFP. Well, that's only a few ideas, right? And that's only so good. But if we wanna open up, open up the aperture to like more and more ideas, we need to not prescribe the solution in any way. And I'm, I'm talking about technical requirements, the way the tech should be built, but even the way that the RFP should be structured because I don't see any place in the federal federal regulations for policy saying that I can't um, uh, do that along with vendors. There, there might be something about like, oh, you can't share your budget, but everything else is fair game. And so that's kind of what we, we tried out. And so we brought in nine vendors for, for a day long event. Um, the, uh, the person, the, some people in the Smithsonian who are in charge of that particular exhibit gave a private tour before the museum was open um, to the nine vendors that, that, that I brought together. 
Um, we had mixed tables of vendors and Smithsonian uh, cross-functional team to talk about the problem to be solved um, and eventually kind of starting to, to create some scaffolding around the RFP itself and conversations like, hey, if you, um, uh, if you could create this RFP vendors any way you wanted to, how would you like to do it? And we got some great information as well as earlier in the day, just kind of, we had a session of uh, talking about, hey, uh, separating some, some tables of just vendors, some tables of just Smithsonian's of kind of, hey, what do we know to be true? And what do we still have questions about? And then they reported out to one another and the Smithsonian had all these beautiful aha moments where they realized, oh, we really do need to allow scope for discovery and user research. And we hadn't really thought about that before. Um, and that was part of the hypothesis, right? Is that because I had seen in the past where when USDS gets involved early in a procurement, we have these incredible technologists that can help steer the, the procurement in a way that will lead to better outcomes and ultimately delivered product that delight end users. But that is not a scalable approach. Can we bring in incredible vendors that early in the process and can they make that, that magic happen? And I feel like that happened to some degree. Now realize that that is just one test. That's one use case, but it's a start, right? And you always have to start something small and figure out um, if it's helpful at all and then iterate on that. And so in no way am I saying this is the end all be all and uh, this is the way all pre RFP should go. Um, but there was, a, there was a lot learned and I think to and more to be built upon that. And sure. seriously, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so on that note, what you've been describing sounds very positive and the outcome was positive and mm -hmm. showed progress and it's still, um, you know, sounds very promising. Like you said, it's not scalable. I was wondering if you could talk about the flip side, you know, like what is all of this uh, different strategy trying to achieve, uh, you know, from, from the status quo I think in your talk at the AGL summit, you mentioned something about there's a lot of, um, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lack of uh, collaboration ahead of time before the RFP. There's, you know, a lot of times vendors are suspicious that the, the RFP is wired for someone already. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, lack of collaboration ahead of time might signal that. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, it was it was incredibly enlightening to do that user research um, as as was kind of uh, um, solidifying the problem statement and the hypothesis and and the test plan. So again, this was you know twenty to thirty minute phone calls with uh, small non traditional vendors. You know, many many are are, are cash strapped. They're they're maybe a year or two old. They don't have they don't have the business development dollars or gigantic teams to to submit to proposals. They, there may not even be a BD person. It might be the CEO and whoever can jump on it, right? Um, that's that's normal for startups, but but they may be in, able to deliver incredible technology. Um, you know, so you know some of those some of those problems were were some of those things that you you mentioned. Um, and it was just sad to, to hear how a lot of vendors, once they, they saw the language in the RFP, uh, had the perception that it was wired for an incumbent, um, or that it was incredibly confusing and they didn't really know what the government was asking for. One vendor mentioned, I read this RFP 17 times and I still don't know what they want. Well, that's terrible, right? And, and, and especially when you think about, I, they're only allowing me to submit questions in writing and then they will give me a written answer. Well, I usually, it's hard to make that meaningful you know, communication. There's just a lot lost in translation and humans are better at communicating things verbally or, or even better visually and in person and you know where you have the visual and and the verbal as well um yeah so you know even i it, being able for the the ability for the government 
to be asked questions about the problem to be solved, um, which is an optimal situation when you talk about building modern tech, right? So even, you know, us here at Rebellion, um, there are these special contracting authorities that allow us to get on contract quicker and, and work with end users so that we can build technology around those end users faster. What would be even better is that the, the problems inside the government would be more clearly communicated and regularly to the problem solvers on the industry side. So you can create those matches much faster. And what if that could be done even before a procurement even starts? I mean, if you could think, think about, um, uh, for, for us, it's like warfighters, right? Um, people who are analyzing data in order to make really important decisions that save lives, right? And so it, imagine if we had access to user stories from those warfighters, like we could start creating lightweight prototypes right now um, and it would, uh, rather than waiting to get on contract and then wait months to get, you know, access to, to end users. Um, but imagine that being the case across all of government. Um, I think that there'd be a lot more vendors that would be able to, to propose even lightweight prototypes and, and for the government also to, to see, oh, this is how they could probably solve my problem. Um, so, you know, the, the whole, you know, uh, objectives based uh, procurement is actually written into the procurement regulations at the federal level. It's just, um, it's uh, government's not used to thinking about it that way. And, and they say that if, if somebody can't synthesize something into a simple like problem statement, they probably don't understand it very well. And, uh, you know, in government, like we, we just weren't trained how to do that. <laughs> and so, but I th so I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, but there, there are increasingly good, ex better examples of, of doing that. Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, two part question here, as someone who spent the last 12 years uh, in federal government, and all these, you know, doing these experimental procurements on the cutting edge with US digital services, um, exposure to all these, you know, problems and solutions and, and, and new ways of looking at, uh, you know, procurement. What are your, what's your main takeaway for um, your government colleagues? And what's your main takeaway for the industry colleagues? Mm, yeah. Um, so, uh, it, um, let's see. Um, Code for America, they're, they're, one of their taglines is no one else is coming. Um, and, and I, and I really like that. Um, it's, it's gotta be us. Um, the coalition of the willing needs to be able to, to jump in and, and try new things. Um, and we've, we, and, a, and with the right focus as well, right. Um, the, the heart of a lot of the heart of us digital service is public is, is public service and especially making citizens' lives better. Um, and so that focus on the end user goes above everything else. So it should come before my individual ego. It should come before whatever is involved in my performance evaluation. Um, and it should come, it, it, it should make me rethink how whatever is blocking giving the best service to the that end user the citizen as much as possible and so nothing's off the table there in my in my view procurement policy laws it's all on the table if some you know government is really good at like keeping law after on top of law on top of law or policy on top of policy on top of policy and rarely does government ever go back and revisit and see if that still makes sense. Well, sometimes it doesn't make sense. And it, the, the in, intended purpose of that original law um, isn't accomplishing what it was intended to do. And so sometimes it's worth, you know, redlining old laws or policies and coming up with something 
um, that is fair, that makes a good good use of taxpayer dollars, of course, um, that you know uh, focuses on transparency, but also is not a blocker to delivering products. So I know I'm speaking vaguely, but that's the kind of bureaucracy hacking that's absolutely needed. Um, and that's the kind of coalition that we, that we need to, to have as well, is that let's not optimize anymore around our, our, our egos, around impressing the boss. Let's optimize around delivering things that solve citizens' problems. Excellent. Okay. Well, so uh, just a, another two-part question, and then we'll uh, open it up for the folks on the line to ask you questions. This is a, a question about, um, you know, folks that are influencers out there in the industry and in our world. Who, who, do you, who do you follow? What analysts out there, authors who are cutting edge that um, you um, pay attention to? And also, second part of the question, would you be willing to share your reading list? Who do you, who are the authors, you know, what are the books and titles uh, that we should be uh, paying attention to? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I, I probably don't have a very good answer as far as who I'm following in industry and journals and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, you know, because I've gotten to know some of the people at, at US Digital Service, I like to follow what they're, what they're reading. And, uh, you know, certainly it, it it helps that they've delivered technology and I, I trust them, but also uh, uh, some individuals from further away that I haven't met yet, but have done great work. So, you know, I see how Air Force's Kessel Run project has been making a lot of progress and Brian Kroger, um, you know, was one of the leaders there. He's no longer with them, but um, he, he says a lot of things that are, I think are really thought provoking and, and really helpful. And he's, he's not shy about um, telling the truth, which I really appreciate. Um, even when he was within government or, um, you know, uh, or people that are um, trying to, to really make procurement better. Um, so even the small team at, at Air Force AFWorks like, uh, like Chris Benson, um, I like to, Hear, hear what he has to say as well. As far as books, um, let's see. So, so life is very busy for me right now with three kids, 13 and under. So there's the limited time, but I, I did uh, finish recently a, a book called Sprint by uh, Jake Knapp um, talking about um, how um, Google Ventures goes about doing one week sprints with their, with their venture partners. Um, and then um, I've been slowly going through a, a, an oldie with uh, kind of that's UX focused called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Um, in general, um, especially as a result of being involved with this co-design procurement thing that I did with Smithsonian, I am really, really curious about um, how I could apply more and more um, user-centered design principles to the procurement process. So if we think about procurement as a product um, that has users, many and especially um, vendors, um, then I, I just have this feeling that, that that's something I'd like to explore more and more. Um, and I, I just even start thinking to my, myself, uh, like, hey, how, like, how can I um, like, should I get a graduate degree in, in human centered design or user research um, so that I can like solve more, help be a part of the, the movement more of solving more problems with the procurement process? Because um, I, I feel like I have had a little taste of this and now I, I want to do more. Um, so it, it's largely, that's my kind of interest right now is like, how can I learn more about design and apply that to the procurement process to, to solve big problems in procurement, whether it be the state level or, or, the, or the federal level. Great, excellent. Thank you for sharing all of that. Okay, folks, uh, who has a question for Brent? And uh, feel free to open um, your mic. Go ahead, Alberto. Yeah, no, I, I have observations and Brent will tell me if my observations are on the money or wrong. And then at the end, I've got a question for him. 
Um, interestingly enough, uh, Brent uh, Maravilla, uh, which in Spanish his last name means wonderful, and I hear about this wonderful personal <laughs> journey that he went through. Started out in Waterfall, and he beats himself up for starting out in Waterfall, but hey, you had to start somewhere and look at around the time that he entered the industry. You know, he was learning something new, and that's what the culture was at the time. Um, but yet he was part of making the change um, as he changed it himself, as he changed himself. And then um, he, you know, had had the courage to ask the question, why is collaboration bad? Um, you know, let's not arrive at a solution before we've asked and answered all the interrogatories as a, a, a member of a collaboration mapping a user story or use case before prescribing a solution or RFP. Now, the reason I make these observations is I went to the commercial non-government space for two years, came back and saw a huge difference in the way things were being done. And I said, well, wait a minute, who's responsible for this? Hmm, U.S. Digital Services, got to learn more about them. Oh, they're having a meeting at the AGL. Well, who's that? So <laughs> I had the opportunity to attend this wonderful meeting and make these observations. And Brent, the, my question I have for you is, I already told you my opinion. Do you see the successes and that have occurred along the way particularly in the last two years. I see, you know, I think of crossing the chasm, which I know is an old concept, but it's mm. almost like this new way of doing things has gained momentum and has gained acceptance, in my opinion, from what I've seen. I'm seeing listening sessions now where folks are interacting from the government or interacting with vendors, and they're gathering ideas long before procurement ever takes place. And I didn't used to see that before. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I wish I had more visibility and to kind of, you know, uh, what's the inside view of those inside the agencies? It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, I, I hear ruminations of some improvements, um, but we, we've got a long way to go. <laughs> We've got a long way to go. It's hard, really hard to break uh, old habits. Um, and there's, there's a lot of skepticism to fight. Um, and, and so, you know, and they're everywhere, right? Everybody likes to say, you can't do that. <laughs> I, 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 um, I experienced this with a, a, a state in New England who I was supporting and and, uh, and I experienced this very frequently at U.S. Digital Service when, we, when we'd go into meetings and, and, you know, there's excuse after excuse about why, why they, they can't bring in new approaches or start with new vendors because there's, there's just a lot of skepticism and not many, like I said, like the, the coalition of, of, of the willing. I, I, do, I do wonder if for you know the the coalition of of the willing you know people notice that and so that makes its way into and and more people are want to highlight that the good that's going on and so i think that those instances are are bubbling up to the surface and and we hear about them more um as far as as widespread um i i don't i don't know uh, i'm not i'm not sure about that yet um, but I would very much like to see that happen. I would like for the movement to continue to, to, to spread. Um, and, 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 and I think there's a, a lot of uh, wind on our backs as well, right? And so I think more and more for, from the position, from the you know, vantage point that I had at US Digital Service and to hear about the conversations that were happening with, with other kind of higher ups in government, there's more and more willingness to rewrite things. Um, and that's really, really exciting um, to rewrite the story and to think very like dramatically differently about how we approach procurement. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. All right, uh, if I can leave you with one thought respectfully, um, thank you. 
um, I, I, you know, wonderful. Um, just don't forget to celebrate the successes you have along the way. I, I think you've achieved a lot, and I think the group's achieved a lot because I've seen a lot change <laughs> in, in a good way. That's encouraging. Thank you. Okay, next question. All right. Well, uh, last call. Anyone? Uh, looks like Ron's opening his mic. Yeah. Um, Brent, a great presentation. Uh, always enjoy hearing you and your, your position on things. And I think uh, the work that you guys did at the uh, U.S. Digital Service and uh, Jonathan as well um, has, has really had an impact in pockets in the government, if not you know, across the board. You mentioned, uh, you know, that it's important that people look at the services they're providing to the citizen above some of the things that um, they typically look at, for example, what's on their performance appraisal. Um, I'm thinking that in the reality of things, though, the performance appraisal drives behavior, doesn't it? Mm. Have you seen any agencies take a look at putting some things in the performance appraisal that might drive some of the behavior that would help things come out better on the back end? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ron. I, I haven't heard of, um, of any, of anybody that's kind of uh, made some, made some significant changes there. Um, but I agree. I think that that needs to be revisited and, and, and a lot could be done to, to drive better behavior, you know? Um, yeah. So if, if you think about, um, you know, uh, Google, especially making use of, um, of, uh, of OKRs and, and many times they're, they're very, it, it, and, and it very much relates to, um, their, um, um, I'm, I'm looking it up, uh, objectives and key results. That's right. Objectives and key results. And, and, um, many, many times that's part of an, a performance appraisal for, for somebody at Google. Um, and very much many times they're there, those OKRs are directly tied to something that benefits the customer. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't mean to be, be complex, um, but it, it is very much tied many times to to what the something that will give value to the, the end cut end user um and i think that would be really interesting to see something like that in a performance appraisal as opposed to uh the, the ones that are typical that that i used to have yeah yeah well, thank you okay final questions anyone well, Brent, thank you so much. This has been great. This yeah, has just you. been a fascinating conversation. Really appreciate your time. And uh, just want to thank you and thank our uh, AGL members for tuning in today and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you next month. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bill. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.